All right, everybody, welcome back to Learn Solidity in 2024. It's your coach, Mark, and this is episode seven and the last episode in this little mini series. And what we're going to talk about in this last lesson is contracts and money because blockchain and money go hand in hand. They go very, very well together, especially the Ethereum blockchain which is what you are learning how to develop for. And the value of Ethereum's native crypto, ETH, is going up in value and for very, very good reasons. So what we have started to do together in this mini series is we've started to look at the Solidity programming language so that you can develop these very powerful blockchain programs that we call contracts or what some people call smart contracts for the Ethereum blockchain. And the only prerequisite to learning this language is some HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. That's really the only thing that you have to know in order to really be able to do a deep dive into the Solidity programming language. Now, that being said, there's a lot of reasons why we all want to learn solidity. And one of the reasons is that central bankers want to move us into a world where we are all using a central bank digital currency or CBDC for short. And that's really dangerous technology because it's meant to track and control every single one of your transactions. So that's why niches like DeFi, which is short for decentralized finance, are really booming on decentralized blockchains like Ethereum. It's because these systems are open digital systems, they are permissionless, and they're allowing us to conduct any kind of financial transaction that you can imagine without a middleman. Everything is done peer to peer. So the essence of what I do is in addition to teaching you Solidity, I teach you how to develop decentralized exchanges because they can really let you implement very, very cool decentralized business models where every single person who's contributing to the system earns a cut of the proceeds of the software system in a pro rata way. But I digress, and what I really want to just talk about in this final episode with you is how to program a contract to receive money in the form of Ethereum's native crypto called ETH. Now, the first thing that you have to know is that contracts on Ethereum cannot receive ETH by default. In order for a contract to be able to receive ETH, it has to be programmed with one of a few things. The first option is to denote a function using the payable keyword. So we learned in the previous episode in this series that a function's signature can have a number of different specifiers, visibility specifiers, state mutability specifiers, inheritance specifiers, so forth and so on. Well, if you program one of your functions in your contracts with the payable keyword, that function can receive ETH. So that's your first option. And attempting to send ETH to a function that is not marked as payable, the way that you see in the code snippet before you is going to result in a reverted transaction. The EVM is going to revert and your transaction is going to fail. So if you want to program your contract to be able to receive ETH, your first choice is to just add a function in your contract that's denoted as payable. Now, if you were to call a function denoted as payable on a contract, well, then what happens is the balance for that contract goes up. A contract can hold a balance, just like a wallet can. Now, there are a couple of other functions, like the receive function and something called a fallback function that you can program into your contracts to enable your contracts to be able to receive ETH. So these are two special functions that only exist in the Solidity programming language. They are designed specifically to handle the transferring of ETH to a contract. So let's take a look 
at this second way that you can program a contract to receive money. And it's through this receive function. And as you can see here, there's no function keyword that exists before this receive function. It's a special function that exists in Solidity. And it has to be denoted as being external and payable. Otherwise, the Solidity compiler will not let you program this special function into your contract. So again, it doesn't use the function keyword, just like the special constructor function. Now the receive function in a contract only gets triggered if it is denoted as being external, payable, and if a transaction that's calling a contract has empty call data in it. So what is empty call data? Well, first off, you have to make a mental distinction between the term call space data and the term call data with no space in between the words call and data. And I know this is a little bit confusing for newbies to Solidity, but that's just par for the course when you learn this programming language. When you send a transaction to Ethereum and you wanna call a function on a contract, the call space data in that transaction is gonna have bytecode in it. And this is an example of non-empty call data. Because as you can see here in this data field in a transaction, there's the function selector, and then there's also the arguments that are to be passed into that function to be called on some contract. This is non-empty call data. Now, call no space data is specific data location inside of the EVM that's responsible for taking the bytecode in a transaction's call space data so that the EVM can do things like figure out what function to call on a smart contract. Now, unfortunately, if you read documentation on the internet, they don't really make a distinction between call space data versus call no space data. But in a nutshell, the payload in a transaction that gets sent to the Ethereum virtual machine is call space data. And you can access that with special global variables that exist anywhere in your contracts. Now, call data can be empty when, for example, somebody sends ETH directly to somebody else. So when an externally owned wallet account sends ETH to another externally owned account, there's no function to call. They're doing a direct peer-to-peer -peer value transfer, and that's when the call space data is empty. Now, contracts can talk to other contracts, and they can also send ETH to other contracts, and there's a few methods that you can employ in order to do that. One of them is a transfer function, Another way is a send, and then another one is the lowlevel.call function, which is the preferred way for one contract to send ETH to another contract or to another externally owned account. Now, as a side note, you use interfaces when you wanna call functions on other contracts from within your contracts. So just be aware that interfaces are the best way to do that, but there are these extra functions that you can use like transfer, send, and dot call if you want to talk to other contracts. Now, the address data type is a special data type in Solidity that holds an Ethereum address. And if it's denoted with the keyword payable, it automatically gets the send and transfer functions. And you can send money to some other contract using send and transfer. But it's not the preferred way to send ETH to other contracts. The preferred way is to use a low level dot call function. And what you're gonna see here is a low level dot call function being invoked with curly braces and having empty call data passed into double quotes, as you see before you. Now you can also invoke a lowlevel.call function with non-empty call data, but if you specify empty call data, because you're not specifying a function to call on some other contract, well then you can invoke that other contract's receive function. 
and provided it's denoted as being external and payable, that contract can receive ETH. Now, the other way to send ETH to a contract is through another special Solidity function called a fallback function. And a fallback function is a special and unique function that automatically gets invoked when a contract gets a transaction that tries to call a function on it that doesn't exist. Meaning none of a contract's functions match the provided function selector that was specified in a transaction. Now, the fallback function can also get called if there's a call made to a contract with empty data and there is no receive function programmed into the contract. So just like the receive function, the fallback function, which also doesn't have the function keyword before it, has to be denoted as being external. And there can only be one of them in your contract. But unlike the receive function, the fallback function does not need to be denoted as payable. But if it is denoted as payable, it's going to be able to receive ETH. So here is a handy graphic to help you understand when a receive function gets triggered or a fallback function gets triggered, provided they are programmed into a contract. So if somebody tries to send ETH to a contract and the call data is empty, and the contract is programmed with the receive function, then that receive function gets called. If the call data is empty and there is no receive function, then the fallback function gets triggered. If the call data is not empty and there's a fallback function programmed into a contract, well, then that fallback function is going to get called. So the bottom line here is that by denoting your fallback function as payable, you can replace the receive function, but you don't want to because the receive function is ideal in order to program your contract to be able to receive ETH. And the fallback function incidentally can also take arguments and it can return a value, whereas the receive function cannot. These are the two special functions that you can program your contracts with in order to be able to allow your contract to receive ETH. The receive function, which is the preferred way to program your contract to receive ETH or the fallback function. Then the Solidity docs are pretty clear that the receive function is the preferred way to do this. Now, if your contract doesn't have a specific function denoted as payable to invoke, and if neither a receive nor a payable fallback function has been programmed into your contract, then the contract cannot receive ether. So in that case scenario, your contract will never have a balance because it's not programmed to. And this is a handy graphic to determine when either the receive or the special fallback function will get invoked. Now that you have a sort of very, very brief taste of how to program a contract to receive actual money. The next step for you is to start beefing up on security, which is something that I really, really cover in my courses in depth because blockchain and money go hand in hand. And whenever you're dealing with money, you're going to have to be very familiar with a lot of the security mechanisms used to prevent against horrible attacks like reentrancy attacks, which are very, very famous on Ethereum. And reentrancy attacks are so devastating because they could completely drain your smart contract of all its value. So you really have to know how these vulnerabilities actually work and how to prevent against them. And it's really simple once you know the patterns to use. And another thing that you're going to learn as you continue your deep dive into the Solidity programming language is what I call the flow of control. Because when a contract calls a function on another contract, the flow of control moves to that external contract that's being called. And if there is something malicious that's programmed into some external contract, it can do something like call back into your contract and do bad stuff like cause reentrancy vulnerabilities. But there are design patterns that help mitigate against this so it's never going to be a problem or a bad mistake that you could ever accidentally code into your contracts. Now, we've only touched upon some of the basic 
foundational concepts that you have to be familiar with when you learn Solidity in this mini series. There's a lot more to know when you learn Solidity. And that goes in regard to the language itself. And it also goes into how you program a highly interactive front end to communicate with your decentralized contracts on Ethereum. And there are other libraries that exist on the front end that you need to be familiar with if you want to be able to really create rich data user interfaces. And one other thing that I like to teach developers is how to employ something called the graph protocol, which allows you to create front ends for your contracts that are very, very rich in data. And of course, any kind of data that exists within a contract has to be carefully decided upon because storing data on the Ethereum blockchain is one of the most expensive things that you can do, but using the graph protocol, there are ways to store a lot of additional data that doesn't get permanently stored on the Ethereum blockchain. And I spell this out for new developers such as yourself in my new training course, the Solidity Deep Dive. And what's really special about the Solidity Deep Dive is that you do a deep dive into the Ethereum virtual machine and the Solidity programming language as you begin to learn how to implement a very powerful decentralized business model called an automated market maker. So go ahead and check out the Solidity deep dive at www.defidevelopacademy.com and I assure you, you're not gonna regret it because this is one of the best courses on the internet to help you learn Solidity so you can get one of those six-figure blockchain development jobs because your skills are needed in this area greatly. So you've made it to the end of this mini-series. And there was a lot to know, especially if you're new to programming for Ethereum, but there's a lot more to know. So pat yourself on the back, because you've done a great job making it until the end of this mini series. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel because I'm gonna be uploading some amazing information for anybody who wants to build for the Ethereum blockchain. It's your coach, Mark, and I hope to meet you in my course, The Solidity Deep Dive, soon.